Genesis chapter 2 describes the location of the Garden of Eden in relationship to four rivers. Three of these rivers are known, and one is a mystery, uh, the Lost River of Eden, so to speak. Uh, this is the river that the Bible calls the Pishon. Now, the biggest clue to understanding where to go looking for the Pishon River is in Genesis 2.11, where it says the Pishon, it winds through the entire land of Havilah. Therefore, if we know where the ancient land of Havilah is located, then we know where to go looking for the Pishon River. Genesis 25, 18 says, The land of Havilah is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. And so the only land that is opposite Egypt, that is east of Egypt, on the way to Assyria, is the Arabian Peninsula, what is known today as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is Expedition Bible and we're in Saudi Arabia. It is pretty clear today that there is not a river that flows across the Arabian Peninsula. However, what does the evidence say? Was there such a river in ancient times? This is the leading candidate for the Pishon River. If you want to support me and the making of these videos, please hit the subscribe button. Also, thank you for making my book number one in archaeology. I'll leave a link in the description where you can order a copy. So I was reading Genesis 2 in my ESV Bible, and I noticed the map that showed the two main proposals for the location of the Garden of Eden. One is a northern proposal, and the other one is a southern proposal. Uh, I'd been up in the area of Turkey and Armenia uh, where the northern proposal is. This didn't make a lot of sense to me. For one thing, it's very high mountainous country, not really ideal for a garden. The other thing is, is that even though the Tigris and Euphrates rivers start in this region, they aren't connected to each other. And then the rivers that were proposed in this northern area for being the Pishon, that doesn't make any sense at all because that area of Turkey and Armenia is not east of Egypt. It is not opposite Egypt on the way to Assyria. Genesis 2.10 says, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there divided and became four rivers. At some point, the four rivers are one river. The area of the southern proposal, on the other hand, is very intriguing because this is an ideal place for a garden. It's low, it's warm, it's well watered. One of the criteria from the verses about these four rivers and watering the Garden of Eden is that at some point they have to all connect with each other to form one river. And with the three known rivers, the only place that they do connect in this way is in southern Iraq, which also happens to be opposite, that is east of Egypt. And so I traveled to Iraq to explore this area. I'm here at a town called Al Karna, and uh, this is the place where the Tigris and Euphrates River come together and join and become one river. Uh, this river flows down and flows into the Persian Gulf. So uh, the Genesis account for where the Garden of Eden is located talks about four rivers and two of them are known for certain. One is the Tigris, which is coming in from over here, and the other is the Euphrates coming in over here. And then it talks about these, where these four rivers come together to form a, one river. And so we know where that takes place with the Tigris and Euphrates River. It takes place right here. From the confluence of the Euphrates and the Tigris River, I travel further south down to where the Karun River joins them. Now, the Karun River is the main candidate for the Gihon, and it flows through the ancient land of the Kassites, which in ancient times was called Kush. 
there's actually two lands called Kush. One is in Africa, up in Ethiopia, and the other one is in what is today Iran. Now, which one is the Gihon River? Well, it has to be the one that flows through uh, what is today Iran, the Kush of the Kassites, because that is the river that then comes and has its confluence with the Tigris and Euphrates. Of course, the Nile River that flowed through the other Kush in Ethiopia never has a confluence with the Euphrates and Tigris rivers because it's on a different continent. It's the largest river in Iran and where it has its confluence with the Euphrates and the Tigris is a border between Iraq and Iran and therefore a very sensitive place and so it's a bit nerve-wracking going down into that area and I wanted to get closer but I got as close as I could. But you can see the bridge over here. This bridge is not going over the Tigris and Euphrates. This bridge is going over what is called the Karun River. And the Karun River is uh, the main candidate for the Gihon. Genesis 10, 2 says, Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. One thing that really helped me understand Genesis 2 in regards to these four rivers is reading the renowned Hebrew scholar E.A. Spicer in the Anchor Bible Commentary. Uh, there he explains the meaning of this verse because it can sound very confusing. Uh, it kind of has that upriver uh, perspective where it's talking about one river that then becomes four branches that go up to the head streams. And the reason that's confusing is we know that's not what rivers do. Rivers do the opposite. They flow from their heads, from their beginnings, down to the confluences that they have with other rivers. And the Hebrew allows for this meaning. Spicer wrote, in verse 10, the term heads can have nothing to do with streams in which the river breaks up after it leaves Eden, but designates instead four separate branches which have merged within Eden. There is thus no basis for the search for the Pishon in various remote regions of the world. All right, well, my son Barry and I are flying to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia today. Saudi Arabia. Mm. I grew up in this country and it has been 31 years since I've been here and so Wow, it's just such a blessing. I'm so grateful to be able to uh, be back here where I grew up. My whole childhood, I grew up here. And uh, it's just a thrill for me to be back here. So we got into uh, Riyadh. We were able to rent a four-wheel drive vehicle. And now we've um, headed out of Riyadh and we are doing uh, over an eight hour drive today. I am wanting to introduce my team members. This is my son, Barry, What's who up, guys? is also doing the video work mm -hmm. and uh, has been doing a great job. Thanks, Barry. Mm -hmm. And then also this is Greg Strokorb, a lifelong friend that I've known from my days in Saudi. Greg is 1% Bedouin, <laughs> right? Maybe 2%. After a few days of driving, we made it to the Red Sea coast. We began our exploration opposite Egypt, where the Bible says the land of Havilah is located, and then began traveling in the direction of Assyria to the Hijaz Mountains. So I'm standing up in the Hijaz Mountains, and this is the divide. The mountains of Hijaz are tilted. The whole land is tilted across Arabia, towards Mesopotamia. And so you see all kinds of ravines through here. But when it rains, all these ravines flow together and they join and they flow down what is believed to be the ancient Pishon River. East of the Hejaz Mountains is an impressive high plateau of rocks. We're up in the high plateau and you can just see all of the volcanic rock that's up here. I mean, just covering this place. Look at all this volcanic rock. Yeah. 
So we've been exploring the Hejaz Mountains and we've come down into the foothills and we found this beautiful area here. And so we're gonna camp here for the night. After breaking camp, we continued our journey east across Arabia. Genesis 2 says of the Pishon that it winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. This is one of the criteria for Arabia being the land of Havilah. If Arabia is Havilah, then there should be gold in Arabia, and the gold is good. It should be famous for its gold, and in fact, the largest and most productive gold mine in the Middle East is in Saudi Arabia and right in the area of the watershed that forms the beginning of the Wadi Ruma, which is the main candidate for the Pishon River. Behind me here at the base of this mountain is the mine Mad al Dahab, and this in Arabic means the cradle of gold. Uh, in this region, there is also 55 gold mines. Uh, this one being not only the largest of those, but the largest gold mine in all of the Arabian Peninsula. It's been mined for thousands and thousands of years, and it's being, uh, it's being mined up to this day. Uh, also, just to the east, you see this road where the cars are driving, and this is a paved portion of the ancient incense route that was the south to north route um, that the commodities were traded that are mentioned in Genesis 2. So in Genesis 2, it specifically says that there is gold in the land of Havilah and that the gold is good. And here we have all these gold mines, this one being the biggest. Also, it mentions the aromatic uh, resins, the main ones being frankincense and myrrh that were brought on this incense route that passes just a kilometer to the east of this mine. And then uh, the onyx, the precious stones. So the same commodities that are mentioned in Genesis 2 for the land of Havilah are the same commodities that Arabia is famous for trading. And this is the route that those, uh, th that those commodities were traded on. So it just is a, it's just a fit between the description of the land of Havilah in Genesis 2 and the land of Arabia. So we're just coming into this area and uh, looking for a campsite for the night. After another night, we continued our journey. Now it was time to find the ancient riverbed that we would spend the rest of our trip following across the Arabian Peninsula. In the late 1980s and early 90s, the Egyptian geologist Dr. Farouk El Baz, while studying satellite images of Arabia, discovered a huge ancient Arabian river. The ancient riverbed that Dr. El Baz discovered that had once flowed across Arabia is called locally Wadi Ruma. We have made it to Wadi Ruma, and this is the bridge of it behind me here. In regards to the river that Dr. El Baz discovered, archaeologist James Sauer wrote, It may well be the Pishon River, one of the four rivers, according to the Bible associated with Eden. No other river would seem to fit the biblical description. And so it was a combination of both of them that led to the reality that this lost river of Eden had finally been found. This riverbed that you see here is the leading candidate for the biblical Pishon River. It drains the Hejaz Mountains and flows out to the Euphrates and Tigris Rivers. Of course today, for most of the year, this river is dry. But it was formed in ancient times, when the land between Egypt and Assyria, called Havilah, had a much wetter climate that supported a continually flowing river that wound its way across the entire land. Scholars estimate that this river continually flowed until around 2000 BC, when the climate changed, causing the river to dry up. Now we were upriver 
where it drains the Hejaz Mountains, and the volcanic rock that is up in the Hejaz Mountains now can be found in the gravel in the bed of this ancient river. You have granite, and you have this black basalt. Uh, you have quartz, um, all represented that we saw up in the Hejaz Mountains. Uh, these are the Hejaz Mountains. This is the source of those uh, quartz pebbles. You see this deposit of quartz in it running in a vein through the side of the mountain right here. And so you have these massive deposits up here in the mountains of uh, quartz. This is the source for the quartz pebbles found way down below. Now are in the gravel in the bed of the river. And in ancient times, especially when this river flowed, was being pushed towards this ancient river's confluence with the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So in Genesis 2, what it's describing the Pishon River for doing, winding its way through the entire land of Havilah, that is what this river in ancient times did across Arabia, winding its way across the Arabian Peninsula. So the Wadi Ruma was very easy to find. It's huge. Uh, however, it proved difficult and a bit nerve-wracking to follow because uh, we kept almost getting stuck. There was soft sand down in the riverbed itself and the sand dunes had blown over part of the riverbed. And at one point we did get stuck, but fortunately we were able to push out of it. For a comparison, this is the Pishon Candidate, Wadi Ruma, and this is the Euphrates River. Amazingly, the banks of Wadi Ruma are actually wider than the current banks of the Euphrates. So when we got to our first place that we really filmed uh, the Wadi Ruma, we were very impressed with its size. Well, later we're looking at Google Earth and we realize, oh wow, it's actually much larger than we realized. When we got to Wadi Ruma, our first videos were shot here. At the time, we thought that the ancient riverbed ran somewhere along what looks like the riverbed today, which would have looked something like this in ancient times. Now that seemed big. However, what we didn't realize was that the sand dunes had shifted to cover the ancient riverbed, which is much larger and runs over this whole area. In ancient times, the Pishon River would have looked something like this, which is absolutely massive. So this is how big we thought the riverbed was, but this is how big it actually was. Measuring over 1.7 miles across, which is enormous. As we continued to camp and explore, we found several fenced off ancient wells in the bottom of the dry riverbed from when Wadi Ruma was used as an important travel route to Mesopotamia. Following Wadi Ruma, we encountered a serious obstacle when the riverbed suddenly disappeared beneath a huge sand dune belt. Our goal was to cross this sand dune belt to where we could see on Google Earth where Wadi Ruma re-emerged from the sea of sand on the other side. So we've been working our way across this sand dune belt. It's, it's a bit nerve wracking because we only have one vehicle. And so if we get stuck, then we're in serious trouble. But we've camped here for the night. We're gonna bed down and we're gonna hope to find the wadi on the east side of the sand dune belt in the morning. This is our camp. So this is where I sleep in this little tent. Barry likes the big tent. He's got the big tent over there. Greg is way over there on the side of the hill because he snores really, really loud. <laughs> All right, we're gonna try to pull out of our campsite. The problem is we're in kind of some soft sand. And we have street tires. We need sand tires, not street tires. Oh, we're going fast. That's good. I ain't slowing down now. Woo! Okay, we're taking that ledge. Ready? Here we go. If we're out of here, we're free. Oh, camels! Oh, 
السلام عليكم حبيبي يا So on the east side of the dune belt, we did pick up the Wadi Rim again. It was huge and it kept getting bigger and bigger as we traveled further and further along it. So we made it through another night in the desert and now we got a little over a three hour drive into the town of Hafer el Batin. So behind me we have what's called an Arabic Awadi, which is just a, a dry stream bed. Um, and in times of heavy rain, then it'll flow with water. For scale, this is uh, maybe even a larger wadi than most, um, but compared to this, this is Wadi Aruma and it is massive. All along the river up until this point, we had gravel on each bank and and covering the flood zone of this ancient river. However, as we got down close to Kuwait, then all of a sudden this gravel plain just opened up. And the reason why is because this is uh, the alluvial fan of the river as it comes to its confluence with the Euphrates, Tigris, and Gihon rivers. Uh, it, th this alluvial fan covers much of Kuwait itself. And so uh, it just is another indicator of how much water in ancient times was coming down this riverbed. So we have in this gravel plain, all these pebbles. And years ago, the Egyptian geologist, Dr. Farouk El Baz was here. And he realized that these were not indigenous to this area. And he asked a simple question, where do these come from? The closest source for these pebbles was the Hejaz Mountains. Dr. Elbaz realized that it had been the strong flow of the ancient river that had both formed these pebbles and carried some of them for more than 500 miles before being spread out across the alluvial fan. And when we were back in the Hejaz Mountains a couple days ago, we, correct, we collected some rock samples. Um, so we have some rhyolite, some basalt, um, some quartz, all that we found in the Hejaz Mountains. And then down here um, in these, these gravel fields, we found exactly the same rocks, but smoothed um, as pebbles. So we have our, our basalt, our quartz, and our rhyolite. So all, of, all these pebbles started as rocks like these back in the Hejaz. And then as they were brought down um, this 500 mile long river, then they were smoothed into the pebbles that we see all around us here. Uh, Dr. Elbaz did a map of the, of the pebble distribution of this river to show that it was the flow of the river that brought these stones over 500 miles down from the Hijaz Mountains. You just look at the riverbed that we've been following for over 500 uh, miles that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's just astounding the size of this flow. So the question is, is this the Pashon River? In conclusion, there's, we're standing in a, a gravel bed full of a bunch of little pebbles that look like the pebbles you would see um, along a river. And we know that they're not indigenous to the area. And we know that they come from the Hejaz Mountains. And there's a huge riverbed behind us that runs all the way back to the Hejaz Mountains. It's not exactly rocket science as to how they got here. Even when we asked some locals, because we didn't know if we were pronouncing the name of the Wadi right, they said, yeah, it's, it's Wadi um, Al Ruma, and it runs from Medina and the Hejaz Mountains all the way to Iraq, where the Tigris and Euphrates um, join. So it's, it's really not that, that difficult. The more that I researched this, the more that we explored, the more it makes sense of the identification that Dr. James Sauer made uh, that this is to be identified as the Pishon from Genesis 2. We can say that the Bible describes the location of the Garden of Eden in relationship to four rivers that are all identifiable physically on the ground today. And so all of these four rivers in southern Iraq came together to form one river. Now what this place looked like 
before the flood, we don't know. However, uh, I wanted to go and see what it looked like today, and I was quite shocked. I, I don't know why I wasn't expecting it to be such a wet place, but what I found there was a whole lot of water. These are the vast marshes of southern Iraq, near where the Euphrates and Tigris rivers come together. The people that live here are Arabs, but they're called marsh Arabs. Instead of sheep and goats, they eat fish and waterfowl. Instead of camels, they raise water buffaloes. And as endless as these marshes seem today, they covered a much larger area in ancient times, stretching all the way from the Gulf to the ruins of the old Sumerian cities, such as Ur and Eridu. Spicer wrote, All four streams once converged, or were believed to have done so, near the head of the Persian Gulf, to create a rich garden land to which local religion and literature alike looked back as the land of the blessed. According to the criteria of Genesis 2, these four rivers have to at some point connect and become one river. Where does that happen with these four rivers? It happens in southern Iraq. Not to mention that this is also an ideal place for a garden because it's a low place. It's a warm place. And as it says in Genesis 13.10, the garden of the Lord is well watered. Uh, therefore, I believe that the most probable place for the location of the Garden of Eden is the southern proposal, uh, southern Iraq. Romans chapter 5 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous, to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what we long for. We long to regain the paradise that was lost. It was lost through sin, so sin has to be dealt with if we are to regain it. And the only one who can deal with sin is God himself. So God came down, he became a man, he was sinless. The one who died for sin is the one who forgives sin. The one who was raised from the dead is the one who raises the dead to live forever on a renewed earth. That's paradise gained. Uh, this is the story, the historical story, that the Bible is telling. The end still is to come. We have paradise lost at the beginning of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible, and then we have the promise of paradise being regained at the return of Christ at the end of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible. Help me out by hitting that subscribe button. I'll leave a link where you can order a copy of my book. You can watch another video here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.